right, everybody, welcome to Bone to Pick. I'm Michael Davis. We are coming to you from sunny Southern California. And uh, I am absolutely honored to uh, feature our artist of the month this month, the uh, one of the most brilliant musicians, one of the most incredible musicians I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, the great Jeff Beal. Uh, Jeff is a 15-time Emmy Award nominee. He is a four-time Emmy Award winner, uh, one of the most prolific and respected composers in Hollywood. Uh, in addition to that, he is an internationally acclaimed instrumentalist and jazz artist. Uh, his commissioned works have been performed by leading soloists and orchestras and conductors around the world. Uh, he is currently the composer for the mega hit show House of Cards. Uh, with his lovely wife Joan, they are creator of the Beale Institute for Film, Music, and Contemporary Media at the Eastman School of Music, where they recently made an extremely generous grant of $2 million. Uh, he's somebody that I hold in the highest esteem and uh, one of the greatest musicians you'll ever run across. Jeff, thank you so much for taking time out of your crazy busy schedule to come uh, <laughs> spend some time and talk to us tonight about your, your great career. Thanks, Mike. It's great to see you, man. Great to see you. And, and uh, we share a couple things in common, uh, of course, going to Eastman, but we also uh, uh, grew up in the Bay Area. And I, uh, I, in doing some research for this uh, interview, I, I love the uh, quote that your grandmother gave you uh, a copy of Miles Davis' uh, Sketches of Spain, and that kind of got you on your way. I also love that you were already composing works for orchestra for the Oakland Youth Symphony when you were in high school. Tell us a little bit about those early years for you and what uh, what made you gravitate to the trumpet and to, to composing at such an early age. Yeah, well, you know, I the, you, you grew up there too. I think the San Francisco Bay Area is a, was a really special place in the time that we were there, like in the 60s and 70s. And there's a lot of music happening. It was very eclectic. And, uh, you know, like a lot of kids uh, in California at that time, you know, you could take music in the public schools. So mm. I remember going to an assembly with my dad. I think it was about third or fourth grade. And they would demonstrate the instruments on stage, right? So everything came around. And this guy got up and blew the trumpet. I looked over at my dad. I said, that's the one. <laughs> and it's kind of weird, you know, when you're in the fourth grade, you can make a choice that affects kind of the rest of your life. But that was one of those moments when I, it was something about that sound that got me. The, it's kind of funny now when I look back on it, because I think as a young boy, there was probably an, there was something very extroverted and authoritative about the trumpet, which I, which I loved and I still love. But, I, but, I, but, I, but it, it, one of the things I love about the instrument is it sort of has this wide range of emotions. You know, it can be very vocal, it can be quiet, um, but it's always sort of been my voice. And the trumpet was really sort of the gateway into everything. Um, there was a piano in the house, and I would sometimes like noodle around and stuff. But my grandmother, who was amazing, um, there was always a lot of music in the family, going back in the family tree. But I think my, my grandmother, Irene, was probably the hippest one in the family, certainly the hippest <laughs> one in the Beale family tree. This lady was like, she was like a Renaissance lady before you could be one, really. Okay. I mean, she... She, uh, she played piano, she could improvise, she could sing. She just sort of had music coming out of every pore of her body. Her and her husband, when they were living in, in Idaho back in the you know, early part of the 20th century, they would love to hear like the, the latest hits that would come on the radio. And my grandfather would actually sit there and they would notate the words and the music. And they had a way of transcribing them like in real time off the radio <laughs> so that then they could go and play them because this was before it was easy to get like sheet music. And okay, stuff. wow. Uh, and and also, I also learned about her uh, a little later in life, not until I was in my 30s, actually after she had passed, and I, this is my, probably my favorite part of, of her, is that I learned that she was actually a pianist at a silent movie theater in, when, oh, in, wow. in Boise, Idaho, back in you know, the early you know, 1920s or whatever. You know? And that's, when I think about what I do today as a film composer, you know, sitting in front of a screen and looking up and playing, it's so kind of related in a way to what she did, you know, that sort of kinetic visual plus music kind of kind of synergy but as i was studying trumpet um you know um a couple things happened one was that really you know i think every young musician has a few things in their life that were sort of their gateway drug into music and for mm -hmm. me there was really two clear clear things the first one was when i started improvising on trumpet mm -hmm. i was almost like this incredible i felt like this incredibly its ability to unleash stuff inside me that had no other way of coming out it was like the it was it was a it was a real epiphany of creativity and and I knew I, I didn't know anything about what I was doing and I it was completely you know kind of naive in a lot of ways but I knew that I had this 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 innate 
desire to express that kind of music making, that kind of on spontaneous creation. That was like that was like I was a drug, you know. It was like that was a fix, and I wasn't going to let go of that. Um, and then the other the other sort of real prominent memory I think I have as a young person growing up with the Oakland Youth Symphony. I remember sitting in the trumpet section because I studied classical trumpet too, playing uh, in the orchestra for Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. And you know, you've sat in an orchestra many times, and I often tell people, you know. The best place to absolutely hear an orchestra is actually sitting right in the middle of it. Yeah, <laughs> There's right. nothing like that sound when you were literally enveloped by the sound. And I just remember hearing that music and thinking like, wow, I've got to be, I mean, I always was, I was into writing and I sort of knew I was interested in composing, but really it was that moment when I, when I knew I had to be a composer and a certain type of composer. And because what really struck me about playing that music and hearing that music was the fact that he was telling such an amazing story in sound. Mm -hmm. And when I look at what, you know, I've done the last 30 years in my professional life, it's all been about that. It's whether it's, you know, concert hall stuff or playing jazz or writing for film. I think the thing that really, I, lo I love telling stories in music. I love this idea of using music as a vehicle through which some narrative occurs. Now, the last thing I'll share with you, and then you, I'll let you ask another question, I promise. <laughs> See, this is what happens. Just ask me one question. I'll talk for three hours. I love it. No, Do but, it. But, uh, <laughs> go get a drink. Um, so uh, my grandmother, when I started playing trumpet, um, and this is, maybe I was starting to improvise, but this was so early on. I would go over to her house, her house in San Francisco or later in, on in, I think, San Leandro, and she would go into her collection, pull out jazz records and give them to me. And, and there were three, really. There were three that she gave me. One was Sketches of Spain. The other one was kind of blue, and the other one was live at the Black Hawk, and it was so cool because I remember wow. her telling me. Talk about good taste. I know, I know. Jeez. And I remember her telling me when she gave me live at the Black Hawk, I was actually there for one of those recording <laughs> sessions, and I was just, I mean, you know, if there was, you know, if there's one person I wish was around longer, it would probably be her, you know. Yeah. But you know, I, again, I remember sitting in my in my room as a kid, listening over and over and over again to that. Sketches of Spain record and the sound of Miles trumpet and that amazingly exotic but beautiful sound of all those Gil Evans arrangements. Right. That was something, you know, I think when you're young, there's certain things get burned into your brain in a certain way. And and that 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 voice, that that voice of, of that music really, really spoke to me. And I think it's it sort of haunts me to this day in a certain yeah. a certain way. Oh, that's awesome. She must have been so proud of you yeah, seeing what, you know, obviously she didn't get to see everything, Not but all the, she, yeah. I'm sure she got to Absolutely. enjoy a lot of your success, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Well, let's let's springboard ahead a little bit and talk about the your your time at Eastman, and, and we were there together for some of that, and uh, I remember being there. I think I was a couple years ahead of you, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, but I remember, like, people talking that this kid Jeff Beal is coming. Wait till you see this guy. And it was, I mean, you were right out of the gate writing all these amazing big band charts and just so prolific. I mean, the rest of us are, you know, struggling to get a chart. You're like, just, and they were all I, so, so great. But anyway, talk about your time there. I know you studied with, of course, Ray Wright was a very influential person for all of us. And and Christopher Rouse and and Bill Dobbins and 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 the work and you studied with Barbara Butler I think as well. Yes, she's Trump my Trump Trump professor. Yeah. Um, anyway, your your memories of, of being at Eastman. Yeah, and, and like you, you know, uh, people like you and you and I that went to Eastman first as undergraduates, right? We couldn't major in in jazz or contemporary media. Right. All, but the nice thing about Eastman it was a small enough school that you could go there uh, as a student, as an undergraduate, which I was, and be, I was basically at Eastman as a classical trumpet major. Mm -hmm. and, and I also was able to sort of add in the stuff that really excited me, although I really wanted to be a great trumpet player and I was really applying myself in that direction. The fact that Eastman had this wonderful jazz program and contemporary media writing program, that was something that, that I remember my, after my freshman year of, of studying a semester with Christopher Rouse, which which was okay, but I kind of realized that wasn't that wasn't doing it for me right then. I I I, I didn't feel like that was going to be my my time at the school. I felt so much. It was almost like what was happening over in the jazz department with Ray and Bill was much more pulling me. Mm. So I actually dropped my. I was a double major in composition. I dropped the comp major after a semester, um, and and sort of used those extra hours and time in my schedule to, to do all the big band stuff do the jazz arranging, film scoring, mm -hmm. uh, and all these things at Eastman. And um, one of the great things about that program 
uh, is that you know we we did have the opportunity as as much music as you wanted to write and could could generate. There was always a an ensemble that would that would be available to play it. So you know, and to this day, it's still you know like I I I I love learning, and I feel like every time I write a piece, I learn something, you know, and so um, you know the chance to have such a great uh, program where there were so many great musicians that could sight read anything. Basically, mm -hmm. we had a studio orchestra, and I got to write for strings. That was another thing where I realized, like, oh man, I really want to do more of that. You know, mm -hmm. something I do all the time now in my film work, of course. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I still kept doing. Uh, I was still interested in in concert music. I still did chamber music during my time at Eastman. So uh, you know, it was a really amazing, amazing experience. Yeah, not to mention meeting uh, Joan and uh, and. You guys' uh, life together started then, so that's uh, an incredible uh, additional benefit, of course, you know. It is, you know, and 30, 32 years later of marriage, you know, almost. And, uh, you know, Joan was actually my, my big sister in the orientation committee. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> so, Very you good. know, and she sent me a letter uh, <laughs> of, of welcoming me to the school. It was the first contact I got from anybody. She was assigned to, to welcome me to the school. And uh, I remember in her letter, she said, uh, I hear you're a trumpet player. Are you into Maurice or Miles? <laughs> and she kind of had me, Mike, you know how we are as brass geeks, right? Yeah. She kind of had me at that yeah, sense. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, somebody who, Joan was, aside from being a wonderful soprano who sung, you know, lots of recording work in San Francisco Opera Chorus, she also, her father was a trumpet player who went right, to Eastman. Right, right. So, and she, she's a really good trumpet player. She played up through almost all her whole high school career she was, she was going to be a trumpet player, That's so so, cool. so we have we have a wonderful friendship and connection and and um, a musical friendship which I really which re really enjoy. You know, I think um, you know I think as artists we're always looking for a small inner circle of people who you can trust, who who do two things. They 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 service you as as a sort of a, a springboard for your ideas, but also they serve they they serve the 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 role of just sort of like a a support network, you know. Mm -hmm. I think um, most of us artists are sort of there's there's all sorts of insecurities and 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 just sort of stuff you go through that's that's never easy for anyone. And uh, so so for me, being married to a musician has been really an amazing gift. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. That's great. Um, so following school, you moved to New York. You quickly, I remember it like it seems like it's yesterday. Now you had. You already were getting all kinds of critical acclaim in the jazz world. You were highly respected. You have a flourishing jazz career. Um, clearly, you know, you were on that path as well. And it could have taken that uh, road quite easily. And you still do, you know, I'm sure to some degree. But um, maybe talk about that time in your life and what your memories are of being in New York and, and seeing your jazz, the jazz side of your career develop like that. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was funny because we were trying to decide right after Eastman, was it going to be L.A. or New York? And, and um, it was a bit of a toss up. Mm -hmm. But I did feel because I was so into being a trumpet player and I wanted to be a jazz trumpet player that we'd, we started in New York and started in Brooklyn for about two years. And um, it was it was really interesting. I mean, I think it, in, a, in a lot of ways, I think anybody that gets out of school, it's so tough because you know, you sort of in this pinnacle of everything at your fingertips in college and then sort of you get out and the bottom drops out. And there was definitely, that was definitely the first sort of reality hitting, you know. But, um, you know, I, I love being in the city. I, I sort of made, made my, paid the rent by playing a lot of Latin band gigs, mm -hmm. you know, during the weekends, which was pretty typical. I remember, you know, one of our mutual friends, Chris Bodie and I, branded, we, we were in some of those similar, similar circuits, you know, many, many moons ago. Um, and uh, I, I knew that I also wanted to be a composer, you know, and I think the interesting thing when I look back in time on the way the careers developed is that, um, you know, and I think this is pretty true for most people, you know, getting a, establishing a career as a composer seems to be, it seems to take longer just because of the type of relationships you have to foster and to actually get working as a composer. It's just a little more of a, there's a little more heavy lifting in terms of sure. getting well, something of course, out there. Yeah. So for me, the fact that I really was active as a trumpet player, and I was so lucky because uh, in that after about that first year and a half in New York City, uh, through a friendship with with David Mann, a wonderful jazz saxophone player, I actually got my first rec recording contract with with Island Records, and and so I was able to start did a first solo record. Mm -hmm. I and, remember remember it well. Yeah. 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 So you know, and 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 this this all when I look when I look at how that sort of went, you know, I think a couple things happened. Um, 
uh, with with that early work, one was that I was able to really invest in f figuring out, finding out who I was as an artist, figuring out what my compositional voice was, and really investing in that. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of those early solo records were really important for me. Um, not that they were, you know, commercially successful. They weren't. They were all just sort of very obscure, and you know, but but they were really creatively important to me because I felt like I had that chance to really not have the external pressure of of of, of of other other voices, just really say having somebody. It was really it was really a gift when somebody from a record company says, "Hey, I believe in you. Here's here here's X amount of dollars. Just give me a record." Right. You know that's that's an amazing gift, especially when you're young. You know, just that that sort of that canvas. You know, to like to to to, to do something with. You know. Yeah. Very cool. Now, following your time in New York, you moved back to San Francisco for for yeah. a, a bit, right? Quite a, quite a long time, maybe oh, okay. five or six years. Oh, okay, longer than I thought. Yeah, okay. Joan Joan actually got a job with the San Francisco Opera Chorus. Right. Okay, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. being a native of the Bay Area, um, yeah, I I felt like you know that this could be really cool. Yeah. You know, um, and so yeah, we had spent about four or five years there, and it was really. Really great. I felt like I was able to continue my solo career. I was kept making records. Um, I also started to get my sort of my feet wet doing scoring. You know, doing a lot of sort of entry level jobs, writing music. Um, I was doing you know, like industrials for what were small companies then, like you know Apple Computer and Pixar <laughs> and some other companies. You know, right? But these were all these. This was like the uh, the eighties. You yeah. know, like the late eighties. The they yeah. were just starting out. So so I sort of got my feet wet and. Um, you know, I also struck up some friendships that t that, t that ended up being really, really beneficial. One was with this wonderful bass player, John Patitucci. The best, yeah. Amazing, yeah. 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 He played on a couple of my records. And at some point during this time in San Francisco, he asked me, he said, hey, I'd like to see, would you be interested in um, writing a concerto for me? And I thought, wow, that sounds really cool. And I just sort of took him up on that offer. Mm -hmm. And um, so before, it was kind of one of the things that kind of got us down to L.A., but I wrote him this concerto that he loved it. And he played it for Chick Corea, and so, long story short, Chick just decided he wanted to record it um, on his new label he was starting. So I got to come down to Los Angeles, have an orchestra in Mad Hatter Studios, which was Chick's wonderful Chick's, room, yeah. um, down in Silver Lake, and you know we had Alex Acuna do all the percussion stuff, and I got to conduct the orchestra, and awesome. and that was yeah. really fun. Yeah, that was a blast. yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, I guess that was. Part of what led to the uh, all important move to Los Angeles, and what was that? Nineteen ninety three, you moved to. Uh, I think LA? it was earlier. Sooner uh, than that, huh? Do you remember, Joan? Ninety two. Ninety two. Ninety two. Okay. okay. Uh, fact, we got the fact After, check. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, maybe talk about you know what what you were feeling at that time. I'm sure it was uh, having gone through the move to New York. I'm sure it was, you know, I'm sure you were ready and prepared and, and had probably more of a vision of where, where direction you wanted to go. But what was, what was that time like in your life? Yeah, it was, it was actually like, I, 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 I think I just, just about had my 30th birthday a year or so after we moved to, um, to Southern California. And I'm glad that I had that time in New York and especially in San Francisco, again, away from a big city, just to kind of figure out who I was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, artistically. So uh, I, 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 was, I was feeling good, like established. I, w I had enough sort of work doing ghostwriting for guys on a couple TV shows. So I had some sort of steady income. And I also had a sense of, of, of what my compositional voice was. You know, it's it, like that bass concerto that I did for John and some other chamber music pieces I wrote. I was starting to develop a style that was like my sound, you know. And um, it, especially the bass concerto, uh, it was a sort of mixture of Americana and jazz and cool rhythms and stuff. And, and when you flash forward to a year like 2000 when Mark Isham recommended me to Ed Harris for his film Pollock, mm -hmm. you know, I can draw a, a pretty clear line between those, those, that early work and that music. You mm -hmm. know? So you know, I, I, I just got incredibly lucky. <laughs> You know, I, I think I think you know it's just there's so much dumb luck in this mm -hmm. business, and I, it's I was just I was just seeing some some young composers uh, the other night. We had a dinner party, had some some young aspiring film composers over, and I kind of told them, I said, man, I said I can't imagine what it's like trying now to do what you're doing because it feels like everybody knows about it. I felt like mm -hmm. it was, I I, I wouldn't want to be starting doing it now because it almost feels like it's just like there's so much competition. Everybody wants to do it, mm -hmm. um, but but uh, you know I I was really you know prepared, but I was also very lucky to sort of have some opportunities come 
where I can really shine musically. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think you're one of those rare individuals who, whether you came along now or 50 years ago or 100 years from now, you would find uh, your voice and 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 success in in this uh, in this business. Um, you talked about Pollock, and I know that was kind of a, a, a seminal moment in your career. Maybe you could talk about uh, what that was like working with uh, Ed and how that how that all came to pass. Yeah, um, you know, I, I uh, struck up a friendship with Mark Isham, who, mm. it's funny, I, we both grew up in the Bay Area, but I did not know Mark when I was growing up, but I loved his music. In fact, I think it was even when I was just finishing Eastman, uh, a mutual friend of ours, John Working, turned me on to this, this record of Mark's called Vapor Drawings. Mm -hmm. I sure. just loved it. And it was just this wonderful compositions, and he used the trumpet, but he had this very cool electronic palette, and I just, I just loved his work. So... By the time I moved to, to Southern California, we kind of struck up a friendship more as jazz trumpet players first. Mm. But I played him some of my music, and he was he was he was a fan, and he started he was very very generous and had, mentored me on a few things, brought me in on a few projects. And one of these projects was this film Pollock that he was originally they were talking to him about. He was going on tour that summer, wasn't going to be available, and um, you know he I called me and said, "Hey, were you interested?" I said, "Yeah, definitely." So. Uh, we sent it. We sent a reel over. I think back then it was a cassette tape. We didn't have <laughs> CD burners, and and I didn't hear anything. And I heard somebody else got the job. So, long story short, there were actually two other scores that didn't get used in the movie. And so finally, out of the blue, I get a call from Ed, and uh, and uh, I was. I remember when he called. He said, "This is Ed Harris. You know, uh, I." can't find your list of credits, and I'm thinking immediately, thank God you don't have my <laughs> list of credits, because if you did, you probably wouldn't be calling me. It's one of the frustrations of starting a career, as you know, and like, in, until you have, you know, things on a piece of paper that people can read, it's hard for them, it's hard for them to just uh, take, take, a, take a chance on you, sure. but, but what he did say, which I appreciated, which is such a gift, he said, but I have this tape of your music, and I really like what you do. And I said, well, thank God, you know, and, yeah. and so I went over his house, which I thought was going to be like a little meeting. And it turned out the meeting went well, obviously, because we stayed there and, and basically spotted the whole movie together. And I went home and and uh, went went to work on it. Wow! You know? Oh, just like that, you're and, in. Yeah, and it, you know it's funny because I I I often tell people, young composers, you know, it's it's important to get a job and to get working, but it is important to find situations where you're going to really do your best work. You know, to get the right job, get the mm -hmm. right, find the right relationships, the right sort of projects where you're going to really flourish as an artist. And and this was this that Pollock was just that type of movie. I mean, I I, I love painting. I love the I love the type of movie that's really character driven. Uh, and I love those scenes, those painting scenes. They're sort of almost like little ballets in a way. Mm -hmm. So it just felt like something that I could really do well. And um, you know, we had no idea what was going to happen with the film and was at the time again it was just a little independent movie really uh and then flash forward a few more weeks went to went to the toronto film festival got bought by sony film got a couple academy award nominations ed ed for actor and marcia gay harden who actually won for supporting actors so so it was just all these it was almost as this this uh, combination of of wonderful things the movie itself and then the fact that it got so 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 well seen by so many people and there were scenes in there where the music was really featured. Mm -hmm. you know, I remember when I first moved to Los Angeles, uh, uh, we w I went to a, like a, a, a symposium at the Academy of Motion Pictures, and Henry, Henry Mancini was there, along with some other guys. And it was so, such a thrill to see him. And they were all sort of showing scenes, so he showed uh, the main title sequence from Pink Panther, which is, of course, amazing. Right? Yeah. Amazing music, amazing animation. And he said something, this is, this is around when we first moved to Los Angeles, that really stuck with me, and I thought about it when I did that movie. He said, well, often in times, you know, in film, we're sort of serving the drama, we're in the background, kind of doing our thing. But every once in a while, a scene comes along where the music really comes to the forefront. And he says, when those kind of things come up to you, that's like your pitch. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you got to swing for the fences. Yeah. You want to get so many of those in a career. You wow. Know? Good advice, right? It was. Yeah, thank thank you, Henry. Yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah. Well, one of the fun things uh, in, in preparing for this was I, I downloaded several of your bios and just cross-referencing things. And I mean, the amount of your body of work following Monk is just, it's tremendous. I mean, the amount of both films and TV series. And um, 
you know, I just wanted you to maybe talk about some of the pivotal uh, work that you did after that. I know Monk was a big series for you in Carnival and, and uh, just what were the things that followed that that kind of continued to uh, steamroll what you were doing? Yeah, well, it's funny because when I did Pollock, I thought for sure that this was going to launch some sort of a feature film career, you know. Mm. And, and instead, it, 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 I ended up in a different place, which I think in retrospect was the perfect place for me, which was this sort of uh, very high-end, um, really well done t television mm -hmm. stuff. And, and especially Carnival, I mean, I, I remember very clearly that I got the call to, to demo for that show based on, the, on what I did on Pollock. And uh, so that's... I can really trace my real, whole relationship with HBO right back to that to that credit, and then after that, Rome, which was another amazing, amazing show. Um, I loved doing Monk. Uh, I, did, I can't believe I did eight seasons of that show, and um, just an incredible experience. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I was answering a question just the other day when somebody said, "What, what, what's your genre? What, what are you? Are you a drama guy? Are you a comedy guy?" And, and I think about the fun I've had doing doing comedies versus dramas, and and I think the thing that I that that that's similar between a lot of these different projects where I feel like again like I've been in the zone doing doing my thing is that they tend to be character driven and actor driven. I think it goes right back to my 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 roots as a jazz player. I mean, when I'm writing for film, I feel like I'm playing in a band. Like, mm -hmm. You know, it's like that fun. You know how he does when you're playing jazz. It's all about you're listening to what everybody's doing. You're reacting to it. And I really love working with actors. I feel like I'm part of their band, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I love that sense of, of when they're really doing interesting stuff, the way in which the right scoring can, can, can take, can, can really wrap around that performance and, and embellish it in ways that doesn't, it doesn't get in its way, but, but for hopefully for an audience really amplifies, mm -hmm. you know, what they're seeing. Um, the other thing that's been so fun about was so fun about those shows too is that, um, like with Carnival, for example, you know, another thing that's sort of been a touchstone in my career is I tend to I've tended to get a lot of these calls, these types of jobs where there was sort of a unique musical solution that was needed, and I I, I do enjoy writing scores that haven't been written yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I think some film I think some some, some composers have a style where it's like okay, you know what you're going to get, you know. And, and I tend to be, I tend to be much more, I tend to enjoy more of like the character actor aesthetic of film composer in a way. I mean, I think it's always still my voice, but, mm -hmm. but the idea of really developing a world for each of these shows. And when I look at, look at the, the things that I'm most proud of, proudest of and the things that were most fun, there was a way in which not only the music itself, but the sort of sound world that you create um, was, was really specific and, and something I got to experiment around with a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about House of Cards. I know that's like uh, hot on everybody's mind. And my, my wife and I sadly just finished the last one. Uh, it, it was so uh, fun on, on so many levels. I love the theme. It's so, it, it's like that whole minor major thing that you did. It's, it's so cool. And, and uh, I don't know what the right word for it is, but it really like, it really like tells what's coming. You know, I feel like oh, I, these characters come out just even in the theme. It's like you did such a great job capturing that. Um, I actually have several specific questions about it, but um, but I love how, in addition to the theme just being sp spot on, I love the way it's almost like a minimalist use of the music to me as a, as a viewer. And I'm waiting like, oh man, I can't wait to hear the next thing that Jeff does on this. And, and it's great how you, the, it just really like uh, parallels the drama that's going on in the, in the show itself. But Talk about how House of Cards came about, and then a couple of questions that I have for you. One is, what does that look like for you when a season starts as the composer? What, how much information are you given? And then for, on and on a on a show to show basis, how much time are you given? What, to, just kind of what yeah. the, like those kind of technical aspects sure. of you as a composer yeah. when you're faced with? Yeah, well, well, starting in the beginning, um, you know, I've always been, a, I've been a big fan of David Fincher's ever since I knew of his film, his work, and I was very lucky around the time I was doing Rome uh, for HBO, the, the title designer, uh, Angus Wall, works, works with David. He's edited several of his movies, and, um, and David also does a lot of commercials. So, um, long story short, uh, I was hired to do a Super Bowl commercial for David back in 2000, I don't know, eight or nine or something like that. 
and and it went really well. And I really hit it off with David. I really liked him, and he was really approachable. Uh, and I had his email address, and so we sort of would keep in touch over the years. And I wouldn't I wouldn't like you know stalk him, but uh, <laughs> but I was always kind of in the back of my mind. I was hoping that something would come up where I felt like I could approach him and pitch myself. And and um, so I saw this 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 show, the story about this Netflix show with Kevin Spacey, who's again saying actors. There's certain actors that are bucket list actors for me, and Kevin's always been one of those people. I'm just sure. like, man, I would love to score that guy's performances. Mm-hmm. He's just like I think one of the most fascinating people working right now. And uh, so I pitched myself to David. I said, well, I feel like after doing Rome, I, I, I feel like I love these sort of big political worlds, and and uh, can I send you some music? He said, sure. You know, so I sent him some music and didn't hear anything for about eight months. And then uh, then I got a call. Um, and in, in the interim, one of our line producers from Rome also got hired by David on the House of Cards. So I'm sure, he, and he pitched me too. So he's <laughs> hearing it from two places, which was great. Um, the fun thing about getting started on that job was that David, um, coming from, he loves music and, he's, and he, he gets inspired by music. Some directors are very, very musical and they, they like to hear music even before. And I always try to write, I try to get involved as early as I can in a film. It's always a great luxury. It's not, I don't always have that luxury, but when I do, I like try to take advantage of it. In this case, I had met, by the time I'd met with David, I'd read four scripts and it was a couple months out before he started shooting, and he invited me to write some sketches for him. Mm. And uh, I said, sure, let's do it. And of course, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, this is probably an audition, too, <laughs> which is okay, Yeah, you know, because, you know, better to know sooner than later if, if I'm the guy. But, but it was a really fun creative exercise away from, like, writing the picture, which puts you in a slightly different creative space. Just reading the scripts, reading the stories, and getting a sense of the characters, I, I started sketching themes. That's, you know, the main title came out of some of that early sketching and some other things. Mm. Um, but, but the show was not, finding our way into the show was, was, was a bit of a puzzle because it's, 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 there's a lot of dialogue, like you say. It's very intense. Um, and there's a lot of the narrative happens about stuff that you're not really seeing. It's all about these agendas and people, you know, there's, it's almost like a chess game where people are like six moves ahead. Uh, and we were, so we, we, one of the things we we spent a lot of the time in the early part of the creative process was just figuring out what is music doing in this show, and and we we, we found a few things. One is that on a, on a certain level, the show is a black comedy, mm-hmm. and and so we wanted to give the audience permission to laugh, which was a fun exercise. And what was the sound of our sort of levity or dark sort of sinister you know thing? Um, it's also a very moody piece. So we how do we create mood? How do we create that sense of sort of this dark cloud of, you know, <laughs> of stuff, you know. It's sort of like the the antithesis of the West Wing, aspirational Washington, obviously. It's almost like, you know, here's how the sausage really gets made. Right. <laughs> View on politics and human nature. And it's also Shakespearean. So it's also, and, and Bo Williman, who, who wrote, who's our showrunner for the first four seasons, is a playwright. And he's got this beautiful sense of language that's really sort of, I, the thing I love about it and is, is it's almost like I just, especially like when Frank and Claire are, are having their sing, scenes at the window smoking a cigarette or something. It's the way I remember people used to talk in movies. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. Which I love. I mean, you know, dialogue, film dialogue has, been, has gotten, the style now has gotten very naturalistic, very conversational. Um, and I always love things that were a little more literate than that. Mm-hmm. Like I want, I, and, and I, to me, like these characters always seem smarter than me. In, in, in just the way they use language, and I love that. There's a sophistication to it. I remember one of the themes I wrote for David that was never anything that we talked about creatively, but just felt right, was this, I, this little film noirish, almost little waltz that be, sort of became the Frank and Claire music. And, and one of the fun things about that little discovery um, was that, that the show sort of wants to have, there's a certain level of sophistication that this show allows us to, to go to. But like you said, it's often very delicate. It's not big. We're not. We're not often not getting big with the music, but but the the little inner workings in the music often have these sort of very interesting little twists and turns. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. On a, it, it's interesting with Netflix. So they release all the uh, the entire series obviously at once. How how did you go about uh, in terms of your week to week preparation of the music? Is there a deadline for each episode on a certain? Time yeah. frame like there would be in a, a, a network release. There is, reason. yeah, and and yeah, to get to your workflow question, yeah, I mean it's it's um, basically you know they've got to shoot thirteen hours worth of stuff, they got to write thirteen hours, so we kind of tackle them in order, 
Um, and, and it's not unlike doing a, a, a series, a season, maybe for HBO or one of the cable networks in terms of the amount of time I have to write all the music. Um, usually, you know, we'll start shooting in the spring, like late May, June, we'll start shooting and I'll start working by late June, July into August. Definitely by August, I'm, I'm deep into it. And then I'll work on the, on the episodes all the way through about January. So really, you know, when we get into crunch time, usually I'm, I'm doing about two to three episodes per month. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, these are more or less going sequentially. Although, you know, there is a bit of robbing Peter to pay Paul where it always seems like we have more time to finish the episodes earlier in the season than by the end because by the end, you know, uh, nature pours a vacuum and sort of the work is always sort of compressing to fill the extra time. And by the time we're mixing, we're looking at that, that delivery date. Uh, and now that Netflix is in 190 countries, I can hardly believe that. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, dialogue, you know, dubbing that has to happen in various in, in sure. various non English yeah. language versions. Yeah. So even though our season four premiered on March fourth, you know, we delivered all the finished music by by about the fourth week of January. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. And and I suppose this is a a bit of a wide question again, and it's personal, I suppose, with whatever director you're working on with. Uh, how many when you write the music, how many revisions and, and, and how much input would you typically get from a director who wants changes or, or is hands off? Or I suppose it's, like I said, personal, but... It is personal and it's really based on who, who that filmmaker is and, and what their process is. You know, on a, I'm on a film now where I've been doing a lot of rewrites and, and that's just the nature of the process and what they want to hear from me and I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, House of Cards is actually really been a dream job in terms of the amount of freedom I have. Mm. Uh, certainly in the beginning, when David and I were working on the first two episodes, there was a lot of rewriting, a lot of, you know, adjusting that went on. But after, after I sort of found my way into it, uh, backed off, all, just, they backed off a lot. And, and I have, a, I have a, a long, I have a, probably one of the longest, like, creative leashes I've ever had, which I, it's really been fun for me because I think any, any artist, when you have that kind of trust from people, it just makes you want to do that, do even better, you know? Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, typically um, we have this sort of very strange, more, more, it's more of an egalitarian workflow now with the show. Typically in TV, there isn't, because there isn't one director that directs all 13 episodes, that person usually isn't the person who gives you all the notes. It's usually a showrunner who in season one was David Fincher and other folks in other subsequent seasons, Bo Willeman in, in seasons uh, two, three, and four, or okay. three and four for me. Mm -hmm. But like now, it's it's kind of cool because our editors on the show have been on multiple seasons. They know the show really well and the music, so often they'll be the ones to sort of give me notes on score on the episodes they've they've done, and of course other people will weigh in. So it's it's sort of a, it's it's nice. I um, certain definitely things need to be revised, um, but I would say probably in the case of a show like House of Cards. 80% of, of what I write as a first draft ends up being in the final in some, in some form or another, which is... Wow, that's fantastic. It is yeah, nice. It's got to yeah. be nice from a, from a composer standpoint to feel like your work is, you know, you don't have to be looking over your shoulder completely all the time. Second guessing, yeah. yeah. And I think and then that show has really been a gift to me in terms of other things because I do feel like, you know, listen, we, as film composers, we are always serving the story. You know, but, but there's something about that particular show where I felt like, unlike a lot of other things I've done, I've really been able to sort of delve into stuff that I consider to be more my personal musical voice, my personal things I like to do. And, and, and I feel like that, the way that music, the stuff that came back from the world for me when hearing from classical composers about the work, and it kind of really encouraged me, Mike, to, to go back to concert composing, something I just didn't have time to do for a long time, mm -hmm. which I've been doing the last couple of years, which has been so much fun. And, it's almost like I, I, I feel like um, that's a whole nother creative muscle that, that was sort of, you know, not being flexed as much, and I'm really enjoying that. That's awesome. Know? Yeah, I want to ask you about that. I just want to ask one more question. Oh, about, stay in House of Cards, No, please. no, no, no. Keep it's, going. But in general, now, I, I've heard uh, it's, it's a famous, the famous living room, the Beale living room, <laughs> there where uh, many things get recorded. Tell me about that. And I know a lot of times you, you know, you will play trumpet on your own works yeah. on shows you're doing and piano and, and everything else. Maybe just tell me a little bit about the the, Workflow. the, the physical aspect yeah. of actually how you go about recording the orchestra or whatever the yeah. ensemble might be that you're writing for. Yeah, I mean, I think every composer, you know, today, like working in, in the business I do, you either 
are a studio owner and slash an IT professional, or you have somebody doing that for you, mm -hmm. you know? Because I was always, from my dad is a mechanical engineer, he's retired now, of course, but I was always into technology, I was always sort of a geek, so, of course, early in my career, it was a totally function of economics, I would always end up throwing up the mics and recording and mixing. But I also discovered very early on how much I love, I really enjoy that part of the job. Mm. You know, I, I, I th for me, especially with film music, the sound of something is, is like probably 50% of what it does emotionally and dramatically for something. So over the years, I've always sort of had various iterations of a home recording recording setup. And this house, the, the famous living room, <laughs> it is kind of famous. Well, I don't know if it's famous. It's I love it. Yeah, it, it it's, it's, you can find it out there on the inner tubes, that's for sure. There's enough pictures. But, um, you know, we moved in this place a few years ago, and, uh, you know, you married well when your wife lets you turn basically your whole central room of your house into a recording studio. It, but well said. It's the kind of place where, <laughs> listen, if I wasn't doing what I was doing, I would never live in a house place like this. But basically, right. you know, it's got the central space, which is, uh, you know, we've run the mics in. It's, it's a great sounding room. I've done up to probably, I don't know, about 25 or 26 strings at a time there. Wow. And it's just a great sounding room. It's got a great vibe. I love working at home. I mean, listen, it's not just budget and time, budget and, you know, that, and, and, and studio time. It's also just time. Yeah. You know? I mean, just, just from a workflow point of view, being able to write the music, orchestrate it, print it out, and then, like, call the band in and then just walk, you know, 30 steps over and conduct it in the same room <laughs> and then come back and mix it. You know, I mean, because of what, the amount of sort of tonnage of music we have to do, um, especially in TV or on film, you know, I, I'm I'm sort of a I'm a bit of obsessive at like getting rid of any sort of redundant things that aren't creative. So for me, you know, this this workflow works for me also because it's just very clean. There's no extra steps that waste time away from just really spending time on the music, which I mm -hmm. love. And I love recording in there. Um, it's a great sounding room. I also love being a music maker. So I do play I do play trumpet on my stuff occasionally. Uh, I play all the piano stuff. My son Henry is a wonderful uh, bass player. He played a lot. Of, he's played a lot of electric bass for me on stuff, including House of Cards. Nice. Oh, that's great. So yeah. So cool. Let's let's talk a bit about your concert works and and uh, you know you certainly mentioned the, the the piece you wrote for John and how uh, pivotal that was in your in your career and uh, um, you've also written things for Larry Combs and Dave Samuels and the Turtle Island String Quartet. It's just pretty impressive. Uh, that in its of itself is an amazing career. Um, talk about where you're going with that, and, and, and you were saying how that muscle starting to get flexed yeah. again. How, how is that uh, Well, going? a couple things. You know, I mean, one thing is that um, there's also a convergence happening between what I'm doing in my day job as a film composer and the concert hall. And, and uh, just about next week, we're going to announce I've been working on this whole House of Cards in concert. Mm. show that I've been working that we're going to announce with Cami, which I'm really excited about where I'm actually going to be going out and conducting this sort of evenly linked suite of all the music music pulled from all four seasons of the show, oh, choreographed a picture, wow, which I'm cool. really excited about because um, that's one aspect of the two worlds uh, colliding. But, um, you know, the other, the other pure, pure concert part of it is about two years ago, I just sort of got this, I had this epiphany where it's like, you know, I need to get back to doing this again. So, um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted, you know, I wanted to write things maybe more from a personal point of view occasionally. Uh, I, you know, being, being a film composer is great, but you're always telling other people's stories. And I thought well, it would be fun if I can generate some of this material and mm -hmm. figure out what my, what is my story, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know. So the first piece I did was a, was an acapella piece for the, that we just premiered last year with the Los Angeles Master Chorale and the Eric Whitaker Singers called The Salvage Men. Uh, I wrote a piece for this amazing uh, classical guitarist, Jason Viu, who actually won the Grammy about a year and a half ago for, for solo artist for uh, string quartet and, and classical guitar, which actually now we're going to uh, expand into like a, a concerto form. Nice. Uh, so, you know, I've just been doing a lot of commissions. I, I, I signed with G. Shermer in New York as my classical publisher, and I signed with a manager in New York, Jim Keller, who's sort of representing me in that world. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny story, Mike, because at the beginning of this, you know, we were sort of getting ready to hang the shingle out. And, you know, we didn't really have an idea. Like, I felt like I thought immediately, well, this, I'm sure 
going back into this concert world is going to be like my film career was for like 30 years, which is basically like watching grass grow. It's just going to be. <laughs> and of course, you know, the thing that was I sort of didn't wasn't, wasn't prepared for was that, you know, I'm so lucky now because of the profile of the stuff I do that, you know, it doesn't it doesn't it, 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 it gets you that first meeting. It gets people intrigued, you know, so mm -hmm. so based just based on. You know, the, guys, the, the guy from House of Cards wants to write a ballet or do something. You know, we, were, we got a lot of great opportunities just sort of coming in. So, so now I'm sort of delivering on those and, and, and writing more stuff. And I'm having a blast, man. I just, I, you know, I, another great example. You know, like this, this guy wrote me out of the blue from Sweden uh, who actually runs this wonderful classical label uh, called Beast Records. And his partner... His wife is this wonderful flautist, Sharon Baisley. And he's, he, I just got this email out of the blue, like, hey, I want you to write a, a piece. I want you to write a concerto. We love your music for House of Cards. I, I, wanna, I want you to write a piece of music for the, he called her the best flutist in the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, let me just see what's up here. So I just, <laughs> I checked out her, and she's amazing, you know, uh -huh. so I'm doing a flute concerto, you know. Oh, that's great. So, you know, it's just like, kind of like, I, I think, you know, the more you try to sort of plan what's going to happen in your life, the, the more you're doomed to fail. And I'm just like, being an improviser, I just feel like, just follow the breadcrumbs. I mean, that's the fun <laughs> of it. You know, I don't know where any of this stuff's going to lead, Mike. Yeah. I just know that, that for me, I always, I want to be, I, the thing that's the most fun about doing the concert music is I feel scared. I feel like I don't know how to do this, and I mm -hmm. like that good feeling. Mm -hmm. it's like I know how to write a score. I can always write a better one and write another one, but I sort of know how those pieces go together, how you solve that puzzle. The thing that's so fun about doing concert music is I feel that sense of discovery and learning and, and, and putting, forcing myself into a new space, which is really, really fun. Now that is awesome. And uh, as a fan, we, I, I speak for everybody. We're looking forward to hearing all those oh, uh, pieces and all the works and uh, where that's going to be going. Let's. This is a, a total gear shifter here. Let's talk about uh, what you've done uh, for the Eastman School of Music, and, and uh, with with Joan, you've created the Beale Institute for Film Music and Contemporary Media. Uh, I I was standing in the wings, just reading the Facebook posts, applauding what you guys have done because I think it's much needed for the program there. And uh, you know, somebody had to step up and and to to make a two million dollar grant. Uh, it's just, it should be applauded. And I think we all are applauding what you and uh, Joan are doing. So maybe talk a little bit about that, how that came about, what, what your motivation was. I know Eastman is a special place to you and you, you know, got a tremendous amount from it, but to give back like that is uh, really profound. Thanks. Well, I think it is important to, when you think about, you know, uh, like Kevin Spacey, who's a really active uh, mentor and phil philanthropist, he calls it sending the elevator back down, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I'm a big believer in that, you know, it's, it's just, it's not enough to spend your life uh, acquiring for yourself and thinking about that, um, you know, at a certain point in our life when we, this is this, a lot of things came together for us personally, we did our estate, we have, listen, we have one child, We've been really blessed, and 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 I just sort of we just sort of had this epiphany a couple of years ago, and it says, "What's special about dying? That that suddenly you can do things with your money that that don't involve giving spending it on yourself." You know? mm, yeah. <laughs> and I thought it would be much more meaningful, especially because of what I wanted to do with Eastman and champion film music at a great school, which Eastman is. I just see Eastman as one of the top schools in the world. You know, um, I felt like there were two things. I, I wanted to see that happen while I was alive, and also I wanted to be a part of it. I've got stuff I want to, I want to share, and that I want to, I want to help be a, a, an agent for, for championing film music and 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 sharing what I've learned over the years, and having a vehicle through which I can do that and bring in other folks who have the same passion. So it just felt like the right time to do it. And I also there were some things that happened at the school which were very encouraging over the last few years. And it's all, a lot of it came from the student body. Mm. Uh, I think the thing that was really convinced me the most was we were back there a few years ago for this wonderful ceremony kind of gathering where we dedicated a room to our mentor, Ray Wright at Eastman. Mm -hmm. and, and some young students at Eastman sort of all sort of cornered me at a cafe one day wanting to study film music and wanting to have some sort of vehicle through which they could, they could learn. And so I started, I Skyped with them for a while and gave them some, some Skype lessons and... Um, about a year, after, about a few months later, about a year later, these uh, many of these same students decided they wanted to start an orchestra to, to pr perform film music, which they did. They mm -hmm. started this or ad hoc orchestra at the school, completely volunteer. They went out and rented, you know, scores from John Williams and Thomas Newman and whoever else, and put on, started putting concerts of film music. I thought, this is a, this is really wow. cool. 
And, and so that, that level of enthusiasm really was inspiring for me because I feel like part of what is happening right now is that um, you know, we're at sort of an inflection point with, with music and with orchestral music where all the symphony orchestras around the world are sort of looking around like, where is a, where's, the, where's the next audience member going to come from? And you always need some sort of a gateway drug to get somebody just to show up and come to a concert. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and also, literature needs to be relevant. Literature needs to be connected back to the popular culture in some way. And so this, 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 we're seeing these sort of green shoots all around the world of, of music from film and TV shows and even video games coming into the concert hall. And something really cool is happening is these concerts are, are really successful. And also, people that have n probably never been to hear a symphony orchestra are actually going to the concert hall to hear it. So, so I really see, you know, the Institute has a, a primary goal, which is to sort of be a place where the next generation of film composers can really study and learn how to write for picture. I mean, I think part of what we have, part of my dream is really the, I have a vision of who the composer of the future is, is somebody who would come to a school like Eastman and study with, you know, David Liptak or Samuel Adler or Christopher Rouse or whoever was there, but also, as part of that training, just being a composer in 2016 would mean that you would learn how to write for the screen. I mean, we are in such a visual culture right now, and, and music as married to visual media and all sorts of storytelling is just so much a part of what we do as composers. It just feels like it's the right time to really, to really step up the game. And this is happening with universities all around the, uh, around the country. What makes it special at a place like Eastman, Mike, is also that not only is the music is the composition program going to be there, but the next generation of orchestral musicians, whether or not you're playing in the studios in LA or wherever, anybody that gets a job in a symphony orchestra, you know, in the next 10 years, sits down, the film music is going to come down, it's going to come on that music stand. You're going to be playing this literature. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's also a way to sort of, you know, start this, start this hopefully, you know, start this trend of, 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 of expanding the orchestral literature to 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 include film music as legitimate, you know, concert hall fare. I mean, I, I don't know. It's all not great. It's, you know, but but I do feel like that is where some of our our modern day orchestral music is going to come from. Yeah, man, that's uh, incredibly well said. And and I just wanted to add, you know, in addition to the fact that you made this incredibly generous uh, uh, grant, you're you are investing your time and your expertise and your, you know, uh, comrades who are uh, successful out here. So what a tremendous resource for the students that are going to be, uh, be lucky yeah. enough to be at the Institute. I'm very excited about it. And, and part of what we want to do is to bring, you know, what the program's going to launch, you know, we've had to get a degree approved by the state. I mean, there's this hoops that have to be jumped through to get a, to get this going, but it'll be a two years master's program. It'll start in the fall of 2017. And, and I'm very excited is that one of the things we'd love to do is to bring those students out to LA for a week or something, you know, and during the course of the year or during the summer for a little yeah. intensive in LA, because, you know, just there's a, there's issues of geography with any any music school that isn't in Los Angeles in terms of having access to me, you know, my colleagues who can sort of give them some hands-on experience and mentoring. Sure, uh, yeah. Which will be fun. Yeah, what an what an opportunity. We'll we'll, we'll all be watching and uh, rooting you on with that. It's Thanks, uh, it's man. amazing what you're doing. Thank there. you. Jeff, I can't thank you enough. I, I've been looking forward to this ever since uh, we found out you had, had time in your schedule to come over. I, I really appreciate it. And it's been just an absolute uh, a joy to catch up after all these years. And I, I always like to close out with kind of a look to younger people. And uh, since we had such an enjoyable conversation about our two sons, um, in addition to what advice you would give to a young person, we can even personalize it even more. What What advice would you give to your son who's uh, having a flourishing uh, time as a bass player at uh, University of North Texas and, and is, has vocal talents, and I'm sure he's going to develop uh, comp compositional talents uh, like yourself. Um, what advice would you have for him as he gets out of school and he, as he tries to be a musician in, in whatever it will be, 2018 or 2020 and beyond? Uh, where do you see things going for young folks? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's there's a couple things I'd I'd say to young people, and I look at your career and, and other people that have that have weathered so many years of of just building a career for themselves. And I think the main one of the main qualities any young artist needs is just a sense of resilience and and passion, because you know it's sort of baked into the equation that that becoming an artist and developing a life and a career as an artist is going to be full of roadblocks. And 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 rejection, <laughs> and and hard work. So 
So I, I think that would be one of my first, my first things. And, and the other thing, uh, I think the musician of tomorrow, uh, and the kids know this actually, you know, but the, the idea of entrepreneurship is really important. It's always been with us. It's always been important. Sure. And this is something that even Eastman has really done really well in the last 10, 15 years in terms of really developing this with their students. But it's just not enough to be good on your instrument and to know all your stuff. You have to really be a good entrepreneur. You have to understand how to market yourself, how to, how to network, um, and how to, and how to find, find a way to circulate in the world so that you can actually start to put those building blocks together. Mm -hmm. The thing that's fascinating about it is you have no idea how it's going to fit together, and that's the joy of it, you know. But, 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 but you have to be committed to, to, to engaging in that. I also feel like geography is incredibly important. I listened to a podcast several years ago, which I loved, and it was all about how the amount of success people have in a chosen field can be, there's a great percentage of that can actually be linked back to geography. Mm. <laughs> and I do think, you know, I see that in my own life with, you know, Los Angeles is clearly the place for somebody like me to flourish. I, mm -hmm. I had, you know, some sort of incremental, you know, things happen in other cities, but really it was here that that, that really flourished. So I do feel like you should put a lot of thought of into where you're going to land ge geographically. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also this idea of, of technology, I think, is incredibly important. I mean, I, I work with all sorts of musicians, and, and, and the idea, the ability to re remotely record yourself is, is huge. You know, the ability to be, play any style of music, I think, is really important. I think, you know, music has changed so much. Uh, it's, it's a much more eclectic universe in a way, you know. And so I do feel like the more uh, sort of breadth of styles you can master and put yourself in every kind of possible situation you can imagine, you know, is, is great because I feel like that sort of uh, diversity can really serve you well. Mm -hmm. Wow, incredibly well. So I'm going to give you my tuition dollars. There okay, it is. Good. You just... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. My so pleasure. great to Thanks, see you. Mike. So great it's to see Joan and, uh, and uh, thank you, sir. continued success. Uh, you don't even need luck. You just keep doing what you do and uh, working amazing, hard. Ma amazing work. So thank you. I uh, hope all of you enjoyed this as much as I have. It's been an, uh, an amazing uh, time to uh, talk to the great Jeff Beal. And we will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick.